So uh, in, in this sub-chapter, uh, the, the book calls it operating system structure. The most common structure is the most common organization structure of the operating system is the no structure organization. Okay, it calls monolithic approach. There is no uh, structure in the operating system. Everybody can call everybody. Uh, there are many modules. There might be many modules, but our modules are not. Uh, organized in a hierarchy, uh, and uh, as I said before, everybody is free to call, call everybody. So operating system is a one big uh, executable code, uh, which is easy to develop, uh, which is easy to design, but it is very difficult to find problems with this kind of operating system. Uh, uh, also, a crunch in any of those procedures will take down the entire operating system. Uh, as we discussed last time, they, they said that uh, even though monolithic systems, they, uh, uh, they don't have uh, uh, structure, any basic structure, we could enforce some basic structure like this. We might say that there might be, there might be a first level service procedures. From the outside, you can only call these procedures. And these procedures can in turn use these sub-utilities, utility procedures. So this is, there is some kind of a structure here. Uh, everybody can call these utility procedures. And if there is a problem with this utility procedure, it only affects these two service procedures. So it, is, it has some kind of a uh, structure. After that, he said that uh, there are layered systems. In the layered systems, see, we have only one, two layers here. In the layered systems, you, ha you have many, many, many layers. At the bottom, you have the uh, processor allocation multiplying core of the operating system, the kernel. Then on top of it, uh, you have the memory management. On top of it, uh, communication, then input output, then we have the user programs, okay? This was a very old operating system, the operating system. Uh, this was mostly more theoretical work. But uh, when it comes to multics, we talked about this multics all the time, that it was a third generation operating system. It was a very advanced operating system for its time. Matrix invented something, rings. Say that at the core, they have this process allocation and multi-programming, then the second ring, and the third ring, and the number of rings is, number of rings is like n. And there is no limit then, because the users can add to these the, the, uh, rings to, uh, for example, if I set up my ring, I would say that, uh, uh, the, the ring outside the, outside of my ring can call only my procedures. You can say this kind of stuff. Even though uh, the, the operating system used this structure as a design tool, in the practice they didn't use it in, in the real time. Uh, Maltix enforces this uh, structure uh, for the real operating system. So if somebody from this ring wants to, wants to access directly to this ring, uh, the operating system prevented that from happening. Okay, so this was a layered structure. What is the advantage of layered structure? You would say that your most important uh, layer is this one. Uh, if you have a problem with this layer, then it's a problem of that layer. That would not crash the communication or the memory management layers. Okay, only the output, input output management uh, uh, uh, crashes. You can restart uh, input output management layer without crashing your whole computer operating system. Or if there is a, a problem with the memory mm -hmm. management, you know that it is a problem with this uh, layer. So it is uh, very convenient to find the errors, localize the errors, also isolate the errors. With this structure, monotic structure, it is very difficult to find the uh, errors because all the service procedures are connected, are, uh, are collected at this layer. Okay? So these are the main advantages of the layered st system structure. Uh, related to that layered system structure, people say that, okay, people say that um, since it is easier to find errors with the layers, 
people say that, some people say that, uh, let's keep the kernel, which is the main system routines, and only the clock interrupts and etc. Very, very basic procedures in the kernel, okay? And let's keep this part, let this, let's keep this kernel part very, very, very small, okay? So in Minix, this, this operating system, by the way, Minix is designed and implemented by the author of this book, the textbook, uh, Tannenbaum. Uh, you, can, you can download it, it can run everywhere. Uh, this Minix operating system says that its kernel is only 12,000 lines of C code and 1,400 lines of assembler code. Okay? So it's a very, very small kernel. That's why it is called, uh, that's why it is called micro kernel. Very small kernel. So what is the advantage? The statistics says that the statistics say that uh, you will have you will have one bug for every thousand lines of code. However, you are uh, careful. Whatever you do, whatever testing you have, you are going to have at uh, around around one line of uh, one line that contains some kind of an error, some fatal error or some superficial error. It doesn't matter. There is an error. So, if you keep the number of lines in your kernel very, very small, then the possibility of having an error, a bug in your kernel, gets smaller and smaller. That's the main idea. Okay? In a monolithic operating system, 5 million lines of code is likely to contain between 10,000 to 50,000 kernel bugs. That's, that's, that's very, very big number. Okay? okay? 5 million means you are going to have 10,000 to 50,000 kernel bugs. With this one, with this one, you are going to have, what is the 5 million, okay, this is 5, 10 to the 6, and this is 10, okay, it is like, for every, for every thousand lines, right? Yes, for every thousand lines, there is a, so, in this one, it is around 15,000, you are going to have uh, 4 to 5, just, just four or five bugs if, if you wrote your uh, code very carefully in the kernel. <coughs> Which means your kernel cannot be crashed very easily because the possibility of having a bug in the kernel is very, very small. Uh, so I keep my kernel small. Uh, that's the positive side, that's the advantage. What is the disadvantage? I mean, if, if this is the perfect way of designing operating system, then everybody would do it that way. They are not doing it that way. What is the problem with this picture? Keeping the kernel is uh, keeping the kernel small is good because you will have less bugs, less uh, problematic code, so your kernel will not easily crash. It will be very very robust. But there is a downside to it. What is the problem of keeping this kernel small? Yes. Hocam diğer önemli şeyleri user mode'a koymak zorunda kalıyor bu sefer. So what is the problem with uh, keeping these file system, shell, uh, print services, network services in the user mode. So what is the problem? Keep them in the user mode, that, that's okay. That's what I'm saying. That's the question actually. Why, why, do, why, why, do, why do you want to, why do other systems want to keep all of these in the kernel mode? There is an advantage to it. Because, because of switching from user mode to kernel mode is expensive. Context switching required, it is expensive. And if you keep this very, very small, then you need to switch from the user mode to kernel mode very, very frequently, and that will create lots of problems. That will create lots of problems. What kind of problems? Performance problems. So this operating system might be very robust against the crashes. Uh, you, you have your device drivers in the user mode, actually. If there is a problem with the device driver, that will not crash your kernel. So you will never get any, you will never get any blue screens for your faulty device drivers that are written by some other people, not by yourself. But for the Windows, the most common system crash for the Windows is the device driver. Okay? If I buy this this thing, okay, if I buy 
they're saying, okay, this, this thing requires a device driver, and it, it is written by, by some company in China. If the drive, device driver is not good, it, it causes some problems, then it might, it might uh, crash the whole operating system for Windows, and it happens most of the time. With this, with this design, no, it doesn't happen. But the thing is that if you keep your de de device driver outside of the microkernel, then your driver's driver <laughs> needs to ask the operating system to do some I/O work all the time. Okay, uh, ask the operating to do to do something. Ask the operating system to do something. So lots of context switches. Lots of context switches means uh, less performance, especially with the current hardware, which uses uh, lots of cache. Okay, if you switch from user mode to the operating system mode, the kernel mode. Uh, you have to invalidate your cache, and cache is, as we saw last time, sometimes a few megabytes of code, right? You need to you need to uh, reload your few megabytes of code every time you make a context switch, uh, which becomes more and more expensive. You are not using your cache very efficiently, uh, and uh, you are wasting your time uh, invalidating and validating your cache all the time. Okay, so that's the downside. That's why this is an experimental system. Nobody uses this system in the real life because it is designed to teach the operating systems. Okay, uh, this one, this one, the, but the original Linux was the main idea of the Linux operating system. Actually, uh, this author of this book designed and implemented a Linux operating system. <coughs> it was a very small but useful operating system. So people started asking him uh, to write some device drivers for the operating system. So that it can be used in the real life, he said, "No, I don't. I don't. I don't write that kind of code because I will keep this operating system as a teaching tool." So somebody else got the idea from Linux and he started writing his own operating system, Linux, uh, that time. And Linux uh, was born from that uh, idea. So Linux was kind of the, main, the the the core idea of the Linux operating system. Okay, so the author still keeps this operating system and it uses this microkernel ID. What else? Uh, uh, similar to uh, microkernels, we have client server model. Okay, usually it is used by the networking people that it's a, it's a operating system structure actually. It's a slight variation from the mi <coughs> microkernel idea. It says that we will have two classes of processes. Okay, <coughs> one is the server, the other is the uh, the other is the client. Server processes and the client processes, okay? And uh, client processes uses the, uh, uses the servers to do some stuff, and the communication between these uh, clients, uh, communication between these client and servers is done through the kernel. Kernel is here, okay? Kernel is here. When you are a client process, you want something uh, to, to, to, to be done, so you ask your file server, uh, uh, server, file server to do something for you, or you ask your process server to do something for you, but you do this through the kernel, okay? You do this through the kernel. If you put these processes in different machines, then you have a networking operating system, okay? You have a networking operating system. So these processes, the client processes or the server processes, they don't have to be on the same machine. It can be on the same machine, but they don't have to be on the same machine. They always, they always communicate through the kernel. Kernel could be very, very small, like this one. It could be very, very small, but all of the pro all of the communication between uh, between the operating system processes are done through the kernel and sometimes maybe through a network, wide area network or uh, global area network, doesn't matter. Okay? Uh, when you generalize this to the networks, then, then what uh, we have the today's network, TCP IP networks. In TCP IP networks, the communication is like that. It, it, communication is done like uh, this way. It's called client server model, and there are operating systems designed using this idea. Okay? So this was the uh, third, no, fourth, uh, fourth way of designing an operating system. The first one was the monolithic, then we had the layer, then the uh, ring-shaped operating system, then we had the microkernels, and we had the 
client uh, client server model here. Okay, uh, then we have virtual machines, another operating system structure. Okay, the idea of virtual machines, as I said before, most of the operating system ideas were developed in 1960s. Nowadays, we are using the virtual machines a lot, especially for the last five, five, eight years, like the VMware, right? Everybody is using it. You can, you can run your uh, Ubuntu on, on top of your uh, Windows, or you can run. Uh, by the way, uh, Windows started, Windows started supporting this Bash, uh, Bash process. I have it, so I have. I'm running. This is this is this is directly supported by the Windows, not from a third-party software. Mm -hmm. If you if you update your computer, if you upgrade, no, if you upgrade, update your computer with this optional, so you have all the Linux tools uh, for you. Everything is here. So I mean, I am not saying that do your homeworks here, but you can develop your homeworks here and later test it on Ubuntu or uh, or uh, or. or, or for any operating system that you want. Okay. So, so what I am doing there is, is, is some kind of a virtual machine. So the virtual machines are very popular today, but in 1960s, they already invented it. Uh, it was invented by the, by, by the IBM, uh, the company IBM. Uh, they had this machine, 370, okay? And on top of, on top of 370, they had this operating system, VM, uh, virtual machine 370, okay? And uh, they have this CMS system. CMS system is a virtual machine. It says that, CMS says that, I am gonna show myself as a, I am gonna show myself as a uh, 370 hardware, okay? So it is like, there is a 370, 370, and 370 hardware here. So whatever operating system you put here, it could be VM or some other operating system, okay? It can run on top of this layer, and it thinks that it is running its own hardware. So this idea of having some layer here uh, yeah, uh, uh, uh, uh, made it possible to have uh, machines like virtual machines. Okay. The virtual machine runs on the bare hardware and does multi-programming, providing, providing not one but several virtual machines to their next layer. So anybody is running on this one, like this one, okay? When I am running on this window, okay, this window thinks that it is running on a Linux operating system. Although it is running on Windows, so there is a layer that, uh, that uh, virtualizes the underlying hardware and the operating system to make it look like uh, a Linux operating system and Linux hardware. It is, they were doing the same thing in 1960s with, the, with this kind of uh, with this kind of uh, structure, because each virtual machine is identical to the true hardware, each each one can run any operating system that will run directly on the bare hardware. Okay, so there was no problem, there was no crashes, everybody was happy. The the the the, the idea was that the idea was that in the in the second generation computers. It was relatively easier to debug your programs because you didn't have any batch processing, you didn't have any multi-programming. You have your hardware to yourself, okay? You keep your uh, computer for yourself. You can do anything you want. You can debug your programs. Nobody can say anything to you uh, until you are done. But that was expensive. That's why they started having these multi-programming systems. And people started missing those days because they said that I cannot debug my program freely anymore because many people, many other people are using the same thing. I cannot develop any system level uh, system level programs because if I if I do something with this system, if I change a few parameters, many people will get affected. So they had this idea: why don't we have these virtual operating systems, virtual hardware on top of it? So uh, uh, if somebody wants to have his his own operating system and hardware, they provided them with this. Uh, layer, your bare hardware, virtualized bare hardware, and on top of that, uh, your uh, your um, uh, operating system, whatever you want. Okay. So that was the virtual machines. Um, so in the 1960s, 
it was available and mainframes used this idea a lot. And then uh, when, when the time came to uh, 2010, people started having the same ideas uh, of having the virtual operating system on smaller computers like the uh, servers and the PCs, that kind of stuff. Because they said that, okay, if you're a company, okay, if you have a company, this is my server, I am a multi, multi core server, maybe multi processor server. On top of it, I am running Linux, okay. On top of it, I have my web server, mail server, CPU or the, the process server, and other, other stuff. So this this machine might be a very big machine, like uh, tens of terabytes of data, hundreds of CPUs, uh, many many I/O ports, etc. Very very very powerful computer, and you are running this operating system. If something happens with the if something happens with the web server, okay, let's say there is a, a denial of service attack on your web server. So it locked up all the uh, web server uh, uh, resources. When it happens, your mail, mail server crashes, your process server crashes, your other servers, all of them are, uh, keep uh, crashing one after the other because this part of the this part of the uh, uh, uh, operating system or the system is crashed and it is affecting the rest of the operating systems. So they said that. Uh, instead of doing this, instead of uh, uh, having this, let's use this idea, okay? Idea of having virtual machines. If I, if I have my hardware, powerful hardware, and if I have a virtual machine layer, if I keep running separate Linux, okay, there is one Linux here, Linux here, and I, have running, I am running now three Linux operating systems, on top of it, there is a main server, a web server, and the process servers. If something happens with one of them, the other two will continue working. It will not crash it, okay? So some people prefer this way. The other people did this. Other people, they said that, okay, I will, have, I will buy three machines, okay? There is hardware one, hardware two, and hardware three, okay? And I will run Linux on them and I will put my mail server, web server, and process server on top of it. The problem with this approach was, it was too expensive. You need to buy three machines, okay? You need to upgrade them all the time. If there is a problem with one of them, somebody has to come. And there is always a possibility of having a problem with one of these, <coughs> because there, there are three times more chance of having a hardware failure if you have three uh, machines uh, running. Uh, so. People said that, okay, don't do this, let's use this, uh, this is much cheaper and more reliable, if your machine is reliable. Uh, and the other thing is that sometimes people did this, they said that, okay, web server is best if it runs on Linux. Main servers are good if they run on Windows, okay, and this processes server, maybe I will use the BSD Linux, okay. So that was the that was the idea of using more than one machine, but in this case you can do the same thing. Maybe you don't run a Linux here or there. You will say that okay, I'm gonna run Windows and BSD on top of that. So in 2010, this idea was very attractive. So people started working on it. People started working on it. Before that, we couldn't do this much because. Most of the hardware didn't support virtualization, okay? For this virtualization, for this virtualization, you need to have some special instructions, special features from your processor. When an operating system running on a virtual machine, it executes privilege instructions, okay? This privilege instruction, that means that kernel level instructions. If you, if you run a kernel level instruction on an Intel chip, in the user mode, not in the kernel, but in the user mode, the, the, the process is just ignores it if you are running it on the user mode, just ignores it. This is very bad for the, bad for the virtualization because you need to know if the user mode wants to run some kind of a privilege instruction. Instead of ignoring it, 
it is essential that the hardware shut to the virtual machine monitor. So the hardware needs to help you to run this virtualization. And Intel did not support this feature until this day. Okay. So from 1970s to 19, 2010, for 40 years, Intel kind of ignored that uh, feature. When the feature was uh, uh, enabled, when the feature was enabled, uh, then we started having these uh, virtual uh, machines running on top of Windows. And nowadays, it is, they are working almost perfectly. Uh, not many crashes. Uh, most of the programs run uh, on top of other uh, systems. As I said, uh, Windows originally started supporting these kind of uh, operating systems, these kind of operating systems, uh, uh, on top of Windows 10 originally, directly from the uh, Windows, directly from the Microsoft. Okay, uh, we will we will have a. If I have time at the end of this semester, uh, I will talk more about virtual machines. Okay, so this is the this was the 1960s. This is today. Not many things changed. Um, there is a there is a process named supervisor. It's, it it does the process scheduling and it does the main kernel stuff. And when you apply this idea of supervising your processes to the multiple operating systems or multiple hardware, you call it hypervisor. Okay. It is, it is not super anymore, it is hyper, okay? Uh, it, is, it is not superman, it is hyperman. Supervisor, instead of supervisor, we have hypervisor. And there are two types of hypervisors, type 1 and type 2, okay? In the type 1 hypervisor, okay, type 1 hypervisor has to do lots of work because it doesn't get many help from the underlying operating system. So it has to perform all the uh, processes by itself. Type 2 hypervisor uses the host operating system. Type 2 hypervisor uses the host operating system to perform the guest operating system uh, uh, tasks. So it's kind of the type 2 hypervisor is kind of using delegation, right? So it may it, it uses host operating system capabilities uh, to do guest operating uh, stuff. In the type 1 hypervisor, you have to do everything yourself. So this is more work, this is less work. And if, if the host operating system does not support, or the processor does not support uh, uh, this kind of conversion, then all you need to do is type 1 hypervisor. All you have to do is type 1 hypervisor, which is difficult, more difficult. And this, this has lots of crashes, lots of system problems. This one is more robust because all it does is it just translates everything to the host operating system. If there is a problem uh, with the procedures, then it is the host operating system problem, not my problem. So these are the two types of uh, virtual machine supporting systems, uh, architectures, uh, that are being used today. But as I said, the, the ideas were, were invented in the 1960s. Any questions on the virtual, virtual machines? As I said, I will try to come to this uh, Topic and talk more about it because it is more important today than, than it, it used to be five years ago. Okay, uh, related to virtual operating systems or the virtual machines, we have the uh, Java virtual machine. We all know this uh, from the from the data structures classes or the object oriented programming classes. In Java virtual machine, it is similar to virtual machines that I talked about. Uh, Mid-1990s, mid okay, uh, when Sun Microsystems introduced this Java programming language, uh, they also invented a virtual machine, Java virtual machine. The Java compiler produces code for the Java virtual machine, and the Java virtual machine runs on top of a host operating system. So the advantage is, um, you can you can run you can run your compiled Java code uh, anywhere uh, where there is a Java virtual machine. You don't have to compile your recompile your code for different operating systems. So you compile your code once, and your code works on uh, uh, works on uh, different operating systems by the uh, by running them on uh, JVM. So it is like 
So it's like this. Instead of guest operating system, instead of guest operating system, I have Java virtual machine here. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there is a Windows or Linux or some other operating. It doesn't matter. Uh, my Java programs runs the uh, say maybe I should do. Okay, this is good enough. Okay. So, uh, so this is this is kind of related to this is kind of related to uh, the topic that I am talking about. Uh, Java virtual machine is um, it's not an operating system actually. It uses the it uses the many capabilities of the host operating system. It just uh, translates uh, most of the uh, most of the service uh, requests from Java language to the host operating system, but it is similar to an host operating system or the virtual operating system. Okay, then uh, we have finally as an operating system, we have exokernels. In the exokernels, the thing here is that the thing here is that this one. This virtualization layer software, virtualization layer software, uh, uses multi programming to run the processes of this operating system, this operating system, and this operating system. So <coughs> it is the task of the virtualization layer here, okay, virtualization layer here, to decide which one is going to run and which one is going to what part of the operating system. With the exit kernels, you don't clone the exact machine, okay? You say that, you say that, I partition the original machine. Let's say I have five CPUs. It says, okay, CPU one will be used by this operating system. CPU two will be used by this operating system. Three and four. So it partitions, it partitions the original hardware into smaller hardware, okay? So each, each operating system might have its own CPU. Also, do the, the, the same thing with the desk, okay? One virtual machine might get the disk blocks from blocks from 0 to 1023. The other one gets from 1K to 2K, and so on. So instead of cloning the original machine, okay, instead of, instead of saying that, okay, I clone this machine, it's the same machine as the original machine, no, it doesn't say that. It says that original machine is something very powerful, very big. I'm going to partition it into smaller machines. Okay? Each one have, will have smaller disk space. Each one will have small number of CPUs. But at the end, it's some kind of a machine. Okay? So the, the, the advantage here is that uh, it is much easier for the exokernel to manage all these operating systems at the same time. Why? Because uh, whenever there is a disk request, it knows that if it is coming from the first operating system, then the first operating system is going to use this area. It knows that, okay? If, if it comes from the fourth one, it already knows that there. If it is, if the, if the uh, fourth request is coming from the first operating system, then it knows that it is going to use the first CPU, right? So uh, it is much easier for the exokernel to make this management. The other ones. They are very complicated because the first operating system and the second operating system might be using the same CPU using uh, multiplexing, time sharing, right? It, it makes it much more difficult to write such uh, operating systems, okay? Each virtual machine thinks it has its own disk with blocks running from zero to some maximum, so the virtual machine monitor must maintain tables to remap disk addresses. Just a remapping. Instead of doing complicated stuff, just remapping. Siz ayırır mısınız ya oradan? Başka bir yol. Okay, uh, so this is the, I guess, last type of, uh, uh, last type of, last type of uh, operating system structure. Exactly. Any, any questions about this? So, uh, we will refer to these most of the time when we talk about processes or the memory virtualization or the uh, uh, file systems. We will say that uh, in the virtual machines we, we apply this kind of design and kind of stuff. So, uh, 
It was the operating system structure. If there are no questions, then I will I will talk about how to write operating systems. Yes. Uh, something about uh, user mode and kernel mode. Uh, can we um, uh, put the drivers, some of the drivers to the kernel mode and some of the drivers to the kernel mode? It depends on the operating system. Windows doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, allow you to do to, uh, doesn't allow you uh, do that kind of stuff. But for the microkernels, you cannot do it other ways. You have to be in the uh, you have to be in the uh, user mode all the time. So it, it depends on the operating system. Well, some some hardware providers, some hardware providers, they might play some tricks, even though the software must be in the even though the software must be in the kernel mode, they provide it in the user mode, but their hardware is kind of limited. You can use that hardware only with the programs provided, right? So it is not a, let's say, let's say I have a new kind of di disk, okay? Let me, that's a good question actually. So this is my hardware, okay? And um, this is my operating system with device drivers, okay? I have the device drivers. And this is my software. When I run when I run my software, I have to use all operating system capabilities to access the hardware, right? So if I put a new hardware here, if I put a new hardware here, if if I want my software to access this hardware, then I have to ask the operating system to do that. If I, if my device driver is not in the uh, operating system area, in the kernel mode, then I cannot talk to my hardware. But sometimes if you put your hardware outside, and if you, you if with your special software, with your special software, you might directly talk to your hardware with your special software only. So that means that only your software can use it. If you, if you, Build a new disk drive, and if you can use that disk drive with your software only, that makes it a very, very limited disk drive because nobody, no other software is going to use. I cannot say my PowerPoint documents to your hard drive, which wouldn't be very meaningful. Right? So, but sometimes you do that kind of special tricks. You just say that, okay, only I will use this one. Nobody else is going to use it, that kind of stuff. Even though this is this is not that easy either, uh, because uh, to, to, in order to in order to talk to this hardware uh, with your software, you need to again ask your uh, you need to again ask your uh, operator to do to do some stuff. Doing this is not easy either, but again we don't prefer. It. So the, it depends on your answer to your question is depends on the operating system. If the operating system uh, uh, makes you uh, makes you put your device driver in the kernel mode, then you have to do it, otherwise you cannot. Any other questions? Yoklama ne oldu? Kaç defa dolaştı yoklama? İmzalamayan var mı? Yok herhalde. Bir yeni imzalamayan var mı? Okay, if there are no questions, then I will talk a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about how to write operating systems. Operating systems are written in C. Okay, so if you know C, you can write operating systems. Uh, well, it's not that easy, but uh, uh, you need to know what C is about. Um, the people are sometimes using they are using C plus plus, but most of the time they are using C, and only C programming language is not is not enough to write the operating system. Remember, Minix, Minix has 14,000 lines of C code and 4, uh, 1,400 lines of assembly code. You need to have assembly. Why you need to have assembly, we will talk about it later. Because C is not low level enough to do some stuff. Like, I need to save, sometimes I need to save my stack pointer, okay? So there is no access to stack pointer with the C programming language. Or I need to do some very, very low level input output stuff. So for that, we have the assembly language. For the rest, C is uh, good enough. So 
C language, what, what do we have with the C language? We have, uh, you know already, C is an integer uh, type-based programming languages. Most of the stuff is actually the, all the boolean's and everything. They are implemented using integer or the basic words of the hardware. We have the pointers. You know the pointers with the C, it is very important. And with the pointers we use dynamic allocation, <coughs> the allocation stuff. But these are all important uh, C language uh, components. We will not talk about that much. But the book talks about it a little bit. We have the header files. Okay. With the header files, lots of uh, prototypes, function prototypes. Sometimes with the operating system header files, we have this kind of code. Can you understand what it does? What does it say? If if I am compiling this operating system on a Intel CPU, then I have I should have this function, acknowledgement function. Intel integer, okay, acknowledgement function. So most of the time, especially for Linux, if you are compiling it on different platforms with different hardware, then you have these kind of conditional compilation statements. Say that if I am if I am if I am being compiled on this kind of hardware, then I will have this. Otherwise I will do that. Because your behavior is going to change depending on your hardware. Okay? Depending on your hardware. Uh, for the large programming projects, for the large programming projects, you have many, many C files and you have many, many header files. In your header files, you have what? You have your interfaces, right? You have your interfaces, C interfaces. Uh, your client or your teammates, uh, the, the, the people that, that, that write code for the other password operating system, use that uh, C headers uh, uh, to implement their own parts. Usually there are hundreds of people, hundreds of people, okay, uh, working on the same operating system uh, uh, project. So those interfaces are very, very important. And starting from 1960s, again, I am going to 1960s again, uh, that Maltix operating system, it employed more than 1,000 programmers in 1960, and they have written uh, four or five million lines of code. Four or five million lines of code. It was very difficult for those uh, days again. Uh, that, that's the size of the operating system. They are, they, are, they are very, very large. They are very, very complicated. Even though they are a layer of software, piece of software, we call them piece of software, right? They are a piece of software, but they are very large and complicated piece of software. If it is large, then you need hundreds of people to write uh, uh, operating systems, okay? So, uh, this is how those thousands of lines, uh, thousands of files, C files and the header files come to C processor first. C processor takes care of, C processor takes care of all those defines and the processor directives and the condition compilation stuff. Then you compare, compile, each C file, each one produces an object file, and these object files are linked, okay, with the libraries, and you have your executable operating system. So operating system is just a single, I mean, if, if it's a monolithic operating system, it's a single process, okay? When you run this one, okay, it's your operating system. Again, it's a program. It sometimes runs, it doesn't, it sometimes doesn't run. If you have, if you have, let's say, 10 processes running on your computer, one of those processes is your operating system, okay? For the hardware, for the CPU, it doesn't matter if it is running an operating system process or if it is running a user-level process, other than user-mode kernel and stuff, okay? Uh, in the old days, if there, there, if there, there was no uh, kernel mode, the operating system didn't know the difference between uh, user mode process, user process, or the operating system process. It's just a process. So, if it's a process, it's a program that needs to be compiled and uh, linked, and it, it has to be run. So, this is what we are doing uh, with this way. Okay, so I guess that's it for this chapter. This is the cover of the book, at least the original. Our, our cover is not like this, right? 
Is, is, is it safe? Okay. So there are many operating system concepts here. So this, these are threads. Okay, we didn't talk about critical region. We didn't talk about pop-up threads. Okay, we will talk about dynamic. We never talk about any of these actually. Okay, maybe at the maybe at the maybe at the end of the semester we will come back to this picture and talk about it. So this is supposed to be funny. The other book, there, there are two main books, textbooks for the operating system. One is from this uh, author, the other one is some other people. And on, on that on that uh, book, you have the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs on, uh, on the cover page, meaning that the operating systems are very old and very large pieces of software, ancient software. So they have to they have to live together uh, in a pit or something like that. That was the idea. This one is kind of uh, likening the operating system to a surface. I mean, it's like a surface. Uh, it, has, it, has, it has complicated stuff, uh, and at the end you are not doing anything because operating system doesn't do anything useful for the end user, right? I mean, if you have a computer. And if you have just a single operating system on top of it, without any other programs, that computer is not a useful computer. It is not doing anything, right? Uh, so you need to have a, maybe a web, web browser or word processor or the scientific calculator on top of the operating system for the computer to do something useful stuff. So it's like a surface a, an operating system. Surface doesn't do anything useless for anything. Uh, after you are done with the surface, you don't remember anything, you don't say anything, you don't need anything useful. Maybe he's trying to do it, uh, say the, uh, this idea. Okay, uh, let's take a 10 minutes of break. After the break, we will continue with the second chapter. <laughs>